Amen. Look inside your bulletin and pull out the white insert. Those are your sermon notes for today. You can follow along. We're looking at a variety of scriptures, so you can follow along with the scriptures there as well on your notes. We continue with our sermon series, Developing Healthy Relationships. So whether you're at work or you're at home, whether you're out in your neighborhood or here at church or at school, wherever you go, even at Walmart, there are relationships, right? And we have to learn how to handle those relationships. When there's stress and conflict and problems in our relationships, life can be very miserable. But if we know how to develop healthy relationships and our relationships are good, life is so much more easier to deal with and to handle. Thankfully, God provides us with gifts, gifts that will help us develop godly relationships and healthy relationships. These gifts we cannot earn, we, cannot des we don't deserve them, but they're given to us by his grace, and they're called the fruit of the Holy Spirit found in Galatians chapter 5, 22 verses, through, verses 22 and 23. I can say the reference. I can also say the verse because this is our memory verse. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I hope you'll say it with me. You'll notice one word is missing because we talked about that one last week. So if you weren't here last week, the word is love, okay? <laughs> All right, let's say it together. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Awesome. You remember that this passage is written in contrast to the deeds and the works of the flesh. So the point being that if I follow after my sinful flesh, if I follow after the ways of the world and the sins of the world and my sinful nature, then I am going to display ungodly characteristics in my life. However, the contrast being, if I follow the ways of the Spirit of God, then submitting to the Spirit of God, this fruit will be seen in my life. Godly characteristics will be seen in my life, and thus that helps me. These are God's gifts, God's fruit to help us develop healthy relationships. So last week we started with love, the fruit of the Spirit of love, and we talked about how to cultivate that. Today we come to part two in this sermon series, cultivating joy for healthy relationships. Now, many of us confuse joy with happiness. Not you, but some people confuse joy with happiness. Happiness depends upon events. It depends upon circumstances. Happiness depends upon happenings, doesn't it? In fact, the word happiness comes to us in English from Welch's language. My wife is trying to learn Welch right now. She hasn't gotten very far in it, but she's liking Welch. The Welch word is hap, H-A-P, and it means luck or chance. Joy, on the other hand, as we talk about the fruit of the spirit of joy, the word joy from the Greek New Testament, it is the Greek word kara. It means cheerfulness. It means calm, delight. And of course, it's used many times, as we see here in our memory verse, as well as other scriptures. Happiness is external. Joy is internal. Happiness is based on chance. Joy is based on choice. Happiness is based on circumstances, and when our circumstances change, we may lose our happiness. Joy is based on Christ, and he never, what, changes, does he? He's always the same. So, not only do we confuse joy and happiness, sometimes we look for joy in all the wrong places. For example, there was an Easter egg hunt one Easter season, a community Easter egg hunt out in a park, and all the parents and children had gathered, the children had their Easter baskets ready to hunt for Easter eggs. So the person in charge set all the children down and gave specific instructions of where to look for all the Easter eggs, and the one most important instruction, don't eat any of the chocolate in the Easter eggs until we have finished hunting for the eggs. 
They didn't want the children to get so excited finding one egg, sit down and eat all the chocolate and then forget about hunting the rest of the eggs. So they finished the instructions. The person in charge sent out all the children to look for the Easter eggs. Well, after about 15 minutes, they blew a whistle. Time had gone, enough time had gone by. All the kids gathered back up with their Easter eggs, except for one little girl. She was missing. Her name was Joy. And so the parents immediately began searching the park for Joy. They were searching around the grass and the bushes, everywhere. No, no one could find her. And so now they're getting very panicky and very worried. They couldn't find this little girl. On the edge of the park, sitting up on the hill, there were several park benches in the shade of the, the trees. And there was an older gentleman sitting there on that park bench. And he's been taking all this in perspective. He's been watching all the children hunt for the Easter eggs. And now he's watching the parents get all panicky looking for somebody. And from his perspective, he could see kind of across the park. And he noticed a little girl sitting up in a tree. So he walked up from the bench down to where the parents were looking. He said, excuse me, are, are you looking for someone? Yes, yes, the panics replied. We're so worried. A little girl by the name of Joy has disappeared during the Easter gun. Have you seen her? And the old wise gentleman just kind of pointed up in the tree and he said, that may be her. <laughs> sure enough, it was. And they finally got Joy down out of the tree. She had found one egg and was hungry and did not want to wait. So she climbed up the tree and was eating all the chocolate out of that egg. And she couldn't answer the people calling her name because her mouth was full of chocolate. So she just stayed up in the tree. So what's the moral of that story? Well, it's what I began with. We look for joy in all the wrong places. It sounds like the name of a country song, doesn't it? You are thinking the same thing. But we look for joy in all the wrong places. Sometimes we need a different perspective. We need to look up to God. For joy comes from God and God alone. So with that in mind, I want us to take a look. You can see there on your notes. First of all, I want to take a look at three relational killjoys, things that steal our joy, and then we're going to look at how to cultivate joy. So here are the killjoys. The first one is this, jealousy. Jealousy is so destructive. In fact, I've seen jealousy almost destroy a congregation before. It is very destructive, it is sinful, it can steal our joy, it causes all kind of conflicts in relationships. James sets this straight, he says, James 4, verses 1 and 2, follow along as I read it, do you know where your fights and arguments come from? They come from the selfish desires that war within you. You want things, but you don't have them. So, you're ready to kill and you're jealous of other people but you still cannot get what you want. So you argue and you fight. You, you don't know what, you don't get what you want because you don't ask God. So James is teaching us here that one of the problems in the relationships is our selfishness and our jealousy. Both of them cause us to compete with other people rather than get along. It also, as he points out, jealousy can hinder our prayer life. You're not getting what you want because you don't ask God. We're so ashamed of our sin, we don't even go to God anymore in prayer. Look at James 3, 16, this next verse. Whenever people are jealous or selfish, what do they do? They cause trouble and do all sorts of cruel things. It's very direct, very specific, isn't it? You can't be jealous and joyful at the same time. It just doesn't work. You're going to do one or the other. So there's no joy in our relationships when jealousy or selfishness takes over. Now look at a second kill joy. Here's number two. A second one is bitterness. So jealousy can steal our joy, but also bitterness can steal our joy. No relationship is perfect. And if you're in a relationship with anybody, at some point in time, you're going to be hurt. We, we're sinful human beings. We hurt one another in relationships. And then bitterness can come into our life because of that hurt and pain. Now, what we do with that bitterness can be the difference between misery or joy. Look at what the scripture says. This is Hebrews 12, verse 15. Watch out that no bitterness takes what? Root among you. 
For as it springs up, it causes deep trouble, hurting many in their spiritual lives. So jealousy, we saw in the previous uh, James passage, causes trouble. Bitterness also causes deep trouble. This actually, this verse in Hebrews, is a quote from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 29, 18. And it gives the idea of bitterness being like a poisonous plant. For example, if you tell your children, you know, don't touch that poison ivy. Don't touch that poison oak. Why? Because it's going to get on your body and you're going to itch and you're going to hurt. It's painful. In a similar way, if we allow bitterness to take root, it's like a poison in our body. And it causes trouble. It causes pain. If we spend all of our time being bitter about a relationship, Maybe someone's hurt us. Maybe someone has deceived us. Someone sinned against us. And we spend all that time being bitter. Then we have no emotional energy left for the fruit of the spirit of joy. So bitterness and jealousy, they are killjoys. Bitterness, it says, hurts us. It hurts even our spiritual life. One more killjoy. Look at number three. The third one is fear. And perhaps you haven't thought much about Fear being something that steals your joy as well, but it can. So jealousy, bitterness, and fear can all steal our joy in a relationship. They can cause conflicts. So going back to the idea of when we get hurt by someone, not only is there that temptation to get bitter and angry and hold a grudge, but we also become afraid to reach out to anyone. I see this happen all the time in people who get severely hurt in a relationship. They turn so inward with fear they don't want to love anyone else ever again. They're just afraid and they're stuck in the fear. Look at what the Bible says. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. Such love has no what? Fear. Why? Because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for the fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. The fear that it's talking about in this passage, it is not the godly fear where the Bible tells us to fear God, to have reverent fear for him and stand in awe of him. That's not the fear it's speaking of. Instead, the fear that this verse is talking about is the fear of a criminal standing before a judge or the fear of a disobedient child standing before the principal. That's the kind of fear it's talking about. It's the fear of being punished, that we've done something wrong. This kind of fear does cause us to run away from a relationship. It causes us to be afraid to reach out in love to anyone. But the verse tells us that God has a perfect love. And what does it do? It casts out, it expels, it puts away that fear of punishment. It puts away that fear of other people and relationships. This is the kind of love that we talked about last week. It's that perfect love of God, an agape type of love. It's the type of love that sees value in the pr and pricelessness in, the, in another person. So rather than be afraid, God wants us to reach out in love with his love. That, expels all that fear. So all of these, though, bitterness, jealousy, and fear, they can steal our joy in relationships. So if those are the behaviors and characteristics that steal joy, how do we cultivate joy? Well, look on the back of your notes there. Three ideas that can counteract these kill joys. The first one, to cultivate joy from our relationships, I must practice giving to others rather than being jealous. This helps us to overcome that um, temptation to be jealous, is to give. So when I'm focused on giving, I don't think about myself. I'm not thinking about being jealous. I just want to give to others. However, if I go down that road, that sin of jealousy, then I'm only thinking about self, and, and I'm jealous of what other people have. Going back to the verse we read a minute ago, we don't have because we don't ask God. We're so busy being jealous of other people. Well, look at what the scripture, here, the scripture says in Acts 20, 35. It is more blessed to give than to receive. So this is where the joy comes back in our life. This is where the joy takes a deeper place in our relationships. When we choose to give to others 
It is more blessed to give than to receive. So when you make a choice to reach out and give to someone rather than be jealous of them, guess what happens? You get joy. You get blessed by God. God blesses us and God fills us with his joy and there will be joy in the relationship. One of my favorite things to do in life, has been for a while, is to give to other people when I see a need. Over the years, God has blessed me so much financially. People have given to me. They've given to my wife. So many things that we have in our house have been given to us by other people. And so with that in mind, I'm reminded of the idea that the one who's been blessed needs to bless others. The one who's been given much needs to give. And so early on in my life, I began, as an adult, I began hearing the Spirit of God asking me to give to other people. Like, Michael, go get $100 and give it to that person. Go and get $50 and give it to that person. And I began doing that. And I would call my wife and let her know. She said, okay. So... And over the years, I quit calling her because I was doing it so much, she began to trust me that I was doing what God was directing me to do. But it wasn't just about giving money to someone in need. It's about giving of self to others in need. Years ago, uh, I think it was Gary Chapman wrote a book talking about love languages, and we each have a different type of love language. Mine is in serving it is in giving. That's what gives me the most joy in life is to serve and to help and to give to others. And I do that very naturally because that's my love language. But I want to encourage you today, rather than be jealous, give to others. Give to the relationship of a marriage. Give to the relationship of a parent-child or grandparent-grandchild. Give to your neighbor. Give to those that you see need help. And it's not just about money. It is about giving of yourself and fighting that temptation to be jealous of someone else. Rather, just give to them. And when we do that, we become blessed by God. His joy takes a deeper root in our life. So rather than be jealous, practice this idea of giving to others so that God's joy can take over in the relationship. A second idea, look at number two. To cultivate joy from our relationships, I must practice forgiving others rather than holding grudges. As I stated a minute ago, if you're in a relationship at any given point in time, you know you could be hurt. We're vulnerable that way. We know we can be hurt. And the temptation is to hold a grudge and to be bitter about that hurt. But we can do something else. We can choose to forgive. Look at this scripture, Colossians 3, verse 13 says this. Be gentle and ready to do what? Forgive. Never hold grudges. And it goes on to say, remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. So I can choose to be bitter. I can choose to hold a grudge. I can choose to live in that pain. Or I can choose to forgive. Why should I forgive? Because the scripture tells me to. And because God has forgiven me in Christ Jesus. God forgives us freely as we trust in his son, Jesus Christ. He forgives us entirely. God forgives us forever. We are to offer that same forgiveness to other people. Back in 2009, I found myself in the hospital with heart problems. Fortunately, I did not have a heart attack, but I've explained, explained to you before that I had triple bypass heart surgery that day in 2009. After the heart surgery, I was in a room recovering, and they gave me a high dose of OxyContin to relieve my pain. But no one, the doctor, the nurses, the age, no one explained to me what side effects may take place with OxyContin. So there I am laying in the bed, and I start hallucinating. I start seeing people in the hospital room that aren't there. I started talking to people in the room that weren't there. I, had, I thought I was going crazy. 
Because I would close my eyes and open them, and the people would be there. I'd close my eyes and open them. They wouldn't be there. Finally, I asked the nurse, I said, what are you giving me? And she told me what she was giving me for pain. And then I said, does it have any side effects? And she began to name all the side effects, one of them being hallucinations. And I'm like, why didn't y'all tell me this beforehand? When you and I, here, here's the point, when you and I are in pain, we will do everything possible to relieve that pain. But sometimes we forget about what's needed greater is healing. We can relieve the pain with a strong drug, but it may not help the actual healing. This verse in Colossians reminds us that the healing takes place when we forgive. That's the healing that is needed. Forgiving another person brings healing, it restores the relationship, and there are no bad side effects when we make that choice. Yeah, the Oxycontin, it, it stopped my pain, but it didn't produce any healing in my body. Instead, it gave me hallucinations. And you see, when you and I are hurt in a relationship, we do have that tendency to, to want to run away and get away from the hurt. That, that's our idea of healing. If I get away from this hurt, I'll be okay. But what happens in our mind is we began to replay over and over and over the hurt and the situation and the pain. It's like a videotape going on and on in our mind. That's like the hallucination of a drug. That doesn't provide the healing. What does? Forgiveness. That is the healing we truly need. So we must let go of the bitterness. We must let go of the grudge. And we must choose to forgive as God has forgiven us in Christ Jesus. So what does that look like? Perhaps it would begin by getting on your knees and praying, God, this person has hurt me, and I begin right here today forgiving them. In prayer, I choose to forgive them. Maybe you need to sit down and write a letter to that person, and you can write out the pain you have felt because of what happened. You can write out that you've prayed about the forgiveness. You can write out the words, I forgive you, and then you can crumble up the letter and throw it in the trash can. You don't have to mail it. But that process of writing out the letter, the process of getting on your knees and praying, that is the healing that needs to take place. Just running away from the relationship, that's just putting a Band-Aid on it, isn't it? It's not healing anything. So as you forgive, then God's joy will bless you. When you let go of the grudge, when you let go of the bitterness, that's when God's joy begins to take that deeper root in the relationship. One more idea. Look at number three. To cultivate joy for my relationships, I must practice trusting God rather than being stuck in fear. We talked about fear a minute ago, being a killjoy. So we've got to do something about that fear. When you and I look at a bad relationship, we may see something that's not repairable something that just is impossible to repair. But when God looks at that bad relationship, he sees miracles that can happen. So we got a choice. We can uh, remain stuck in our fear, or we can trust God for a better solution. Look with me at the scripture. This is Psalm 62, verse 8. People trust God all the time. It doesn't say part of the time. It says all the time. It goes on to instruct us, tell him, tell God, all your problems. Why? Because God is our protection. There is nothing to fear. He is our protection. God loves us. He has our best interest in mind. He wants to protect us and not hurt us. God is our refuge. He's a safe haven. We have nothing to fear. God wants to give us solutions to our bad relationship problems. He wants to give us answers to our problems. So what do we have to do? We have to trust him for that rather than being stuck in fear. And once we hear from God, as we're praying and we're trusting him, once we hear from him, then we can act upon that to restore the relationship again. Many years ago, uh, God gave me the opportunity to start a church on Lake Murray in South Carolina. And that was my first church right out of seminary. So we bought land, we put up a building, we began reaching people for Christ on that part of Lake Murray. And as the church grew, so did 
relationship problems. And there was one particular man in the church that was having lots of relationship problems within the congregation. I didn't know it at the time, but he was an alcoholic, which was kind of the source of all of his problems. I didn't realize that. I, I know it now. But he was actually running people off from the church. And then he got mad at me. Of course, he's gotten mad at everybody else. I would be next in line, right, as the pastor. And he came to my office one day saying he was going to leave the church, but he wasn't going to do it without a temper tantrum right there in the office. And it was ugly. Our conversation was ugly. The, the whole relationship was ugly. And finally, he just left. And I was just sitting there. I didn't know what to do. I thought that was the weirdest thing that's ever happened. Later, I found out he was an alcoholic, and he had caused a lot of problems, even at other churches, I began to find out. But as the weeks and months went on, God began to put his name on my heart, saying, Michael, let go of your fear and reach out to him. But God, you, you don't know this man like I do. Did you see the temper tantrum in my office? Reach out to him. I just kept hearing that over and over. One day, I was driving into town, and I came to a traffic light. It was red, so I stopped. And I looked up in my rearview mirror, and guess who was right behind me in the next car? That guy. I said, okay, God, a sign is a sign. I will call him. And later that week, I did call him. I reached out to him, and guess what? God had been putting it on his heart to reach out to me. What does the verse say? Trust God all the time. Tell him your problems because he is your protection. God was speaking to both of us, and we both were too afraid to call one another and talk. We worked out our problems because of God and developed a healthy relationship again. When we see problems, God sees opportunities for miracles and for his power. When we see strained, unhealthy relationships, God sees miracles ready to happen. So do as the scripture says, trust God with your problems. Tell him your doubts, tell him your fears, trust him for his solution. And then he will put joy back into the relationship. And that's what we need. We need God's joy in our relationships, not fear, not bitterness, not anger, not jealousy. We need God's joy. My invitation to you from this sermon, from this scripture today, is to cultivate God's joy as your joy. We've looked at some ways to do that. And remember, we can't produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does that. This is his fruit. But we can take his love and we can take his joy and we can cultivate it and use it to develop godly and healthy relationships. I encourage you today to cultivate God's joy in your relationships. Will you pray with me about that? Father, thank you. Thank you for creating your joy inside of us. Forgive us for being jealous, for holding grudges, for being bitter and just afraid in so many relationships. You have the power to heal. You have the power to restore our broken relationships, and you have the joy we need. Help us today to start a new day and cultivate your joy day by day in all of our relationships. Help us to trust you with all of our problems. We make this our commitment. In Jesus' name, amen.